It's no secret that the Quran and I have had our differences in the past. But I'm a man of peace and love, so to avoid ongoing hostility and conflict, I'd like to extend an olive branch by sharing my favorite verse of the Quran. You might think that my favorite Quran verse is the verse I quote most frequently, Surah 9, verse 29, where Allah commands Muslims to violently subjugate Jews and Christians. But this isn't my favorite Quran verse at all. I just quote it a lot to help people understand 14 centuries of jihad. Since Surah 9, verse 29 isn't my favorite Quran verse, you might think that I'm referring to one of the amusing verses I often use to refute common Muslim arguments. For instance, when Muslims claim that the Quran contains scientific miracles, I like to point out that the Quran says that Dhul Karnain traveled so far west he found the place where the sun sets, and that the sun sets in a muddy pool, and that stars are missiles that Allah uses to shoot demons to keep them from sneaking into paradise and listening to his secret plans, and that semen is formed between the backbone and the ribs. As helpful as these verses are, however, they're not my favorite. My favorite verse of the Quran is found in Surah 33, Surat al-Azab, one of the most freakishly disturbing chapters of the Quran, and that's saying something. What's amazing about Surah 33 is that, as nauseating as it is, we only have about a third of what it originally said. What we have today is what was left after Muhammad's wives and others sanitized it by removing some of the most abominable and sickening parts. Muslim sources show that more than a hundred verses of Surah 33 are now missing. In Abu Ubaid's Kitab Fada'al al-Quran, Aisha declares, Surat al-Azab, Surah 33, used to be recited in the time of the Prophet with 200 verses. But when Uthman wrote out the codices, he was unable to procure more of it than there is in it today. Surah 33 in today's Quran only has 73 verses but it originally had around 200. That's a lot of missing verses. And we know what some of these missing verses said. In Sunan Ibn Majah, 1944, we read, It was narrated that Aisha said, The verse of stoning and of breastfeeding an adult ten times was revealed, and the paper was with me under my pillow. When the Messenger of Allah died, we were preoccupied with his death, and a tame sheep came in and ate it. We discussed the verse of breastfeeding an adult ten times in my Sheepgate video, which I'll link to at the end of this video in case you haven't seen it yet. In brief, before more than a hundred verses were removed from Surah 33, one of the verses said that if a man and a woman aren't married to each other but they need to be alone together for some reason, the woman is required to breastfeed the man ten times so that he'll feel like her son and won't be tempted to have sex with her. So according to Allah, the proper Islamic way for women to avoid sexually arousing men is to put their breasts into men's mouths this many times. Fortunately, Muhammad's wives had a better understanding of human nature than Allah did, so they conspired to remove that verse and other verses when Muhammad died after he was poisoned to death by a Jewish woman whose family had been slaughtered by Muslims. But in my humble opinion, Muhammad's wives should have taken out the entire chapter. Keep in mind, this is the chapter where Allah gives Muhammad special permission to break the four-wife limit. Muslims are allowed to marry up to four women and girls, but in Surah 33, verse 50, Allah tells Muhammad that he can have as many wives as he wants. How convenient that the man who was receiving the revelations got the most sex partners. This is also the chapter where Allah orders Muhammad to marry the wife of his own adopted son after Muhammad causes the divorce by lusting after her. Since marrying the divorced wife of your own adopted son was frowned upon in 7th century Arabia, Allah decided to abolish adoption in Surah 33 verses 4 to 5. Adoption, of course, is one of the most loving, humane practices in human history, and Allah abolishes it so that Muhammad can have the wife of his own adopted son. Anywho, this utterly detestable chapter is the chapter that contains my favorite Quran verse. My favorite verse of the Quran is Surah 33, verse 53. Surah 33, verse 53 is my favorite verse because it shows beyond any rational doubt what the Quran really is. 
The historical background of the verse is that Muhammad would sometimes invite people to one of his many houses for dinner, but people would show up early or stay late because they wanted to talk to him and ask him questions. Muhammad didn't want these people hanging around, but he was too shy to tell them that they were annoying him. That's when Allah stepped in and revealed Surah 33, verse 53. O oh, you who believe, enter not the prophet's houses unless permission is given to you for a meal, and then not so early as to wait for its preparation. But when you are invited, enter, and when you have taken your meal, disperse without sitting for a talk. Verily, such behavior annoys the prophet, and he is shy of asking you to go. But Allah is not shy of telling you the truth. And when you ask his wives for anything you want, ask them from behind a screen that is purer for your hearts and for their hearts. And it is not right for you that you should annoy Allah's messenger, nor that you should ever marry his wives after him, i.e. after his death. Verily, with Allah, that shall be an enormity. Now, think about this. Muhammad doesn't like people showing up early for dinner or hanging out afterwards. He's a busy man, and Islam's most trusted sources say that he liked to have sex with all nine of his wives on the same night, as we read in Sahih al-Bukhari, number 5068. Narrated Anas, the Prophet used to go around, have sexual relations with, all his wives in one night, and he had nine wives. Sahih al-Bukhari, number 5215. Narrated Anas bin Malik, the Prophet used to pass by, have sexual relations with, all his wives in one night, and at that time he had nine wives. Sahih al Bukhari, 268. Narrated Qatada, Anas bin Malik said, the Prophet used to visit all his wives in a round, during the day and night, and they were eleven in number. I asked Anas, had the Prophet the strength for it? Anas replied, we used to say that the Prophet was given the strength of thirty men. And Saeed said, on the authority of Qatada, that Anas had told him about nine wives only, not eleven. Surah 33, verse 50, gives Muhammad special permission to have more sexual partners than anyone else. And Muhammad wants to go from house to house, having sex with nine women and girls a night. Now, obviously, if you're trying to have sex with nine women and girls a night, not counting your slave girls, you don't have a lot of time for chit-chat. But Muhammad's followers want to talk to him, even if it interferes with his sexy time. Sadly, Muhammad, the guy who brags about having sex with nine women and girls in one night, is just too shy to tell his followers to stop bothering him, so Allah has to intervene and tell them not to annoy Muhammad. Keep in mind, Muhammad is the one who's receiving these revelations. One day, Muhammad steps out and says, Guys, I have a revelation from Allah. This is Allah talking, not me. I wouldn't say any of this, but Allah will. Remember just three verses ago when Allah gave me and me alone the right to have more sexual partners than any of you gullible stooges? Well, now Allah wants you to stop coming over to my house early, and He wants you to leave as soon as dinner's over. Again, I wouldn't say any of this. I'm just too shy. But Allah's not shy. He wants all of you to stop annoying me, stop talking me to death, stop asking me questions when I've got better things to do than spend my evenings with people who are too stupid to see what's going on here. How can Muhammad make it any clearer what Allah really is in Islam? Allah is Muhammad's sock puppet, whose primary goal is to give Muhammad everything he wants. Why is Allah so obsessed with giving Muhammad, the puppet master, whatever he wants? Because Allah's a sock puppet, and that's what sock puppets do. You Muslims bow down five times per day to Muhammad's sock puppet. And when we ask how you can possibly believe that this is the true religion, you say ridiculous things like, Oh, the Quran's been perfectly preserved, and the Quran's filled with scientific miracles. Why do you say these things? Is it because you've studied the Quran and its history? Of course not. If you took the time to study, you'd know better. You believe that the Quran has been perfectly preserved and that the Quran contains scientific miracles because your leaders, your imams and sheikhs, the puppeteers, keep the puppet show going for you. 
But instead of getting mad at them for deceiving you, you get mad at me for telling you that you're being used and manipulated. Now, I'm sick of being the bad guy all the time, so I'm not going to tell you that you need to grow up and learn to study for yourself instead of mindlessly believing what your lying leaders tell you. I wouldn't say that to you, because I want to be nice. But I'm happy to inform you that I recently received a revelation from Allah. And Allah isn't nice. He tells you what you need to hear, even if it hurts. Grow up! And learn to study for yourself instead of mindlessly believing what your lying leaders tell you. Listen to the super genius David Wood, or you're doomed. And be sure to watch this video about Muhammad's wives conspiring to remove parts of the Quran. Pretty creepy reducing Allah to a mere sock puppet, don't you think? But Surah 33 verse 21 of the Quran says that Muhammad is the pattern of conduct for mankind. So if Muhammad treated Allah like his personal sock puppet, and Muhammad is the pattern of conduct for mankind, the only way we can avoid treating Allah like this is to reject Islam.